good. All right. Let's, let's go to our Torah portion. It's called Yitro or Jethro. It uh, begins in Exodus chapter 18, verse 1. We're going to read through verse 5. It says, And Jethro, or Yithro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. And then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back with her two sons, of whom the name of one was Gershom. For he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Ger means a stranger. Sham means there. So Gershom literally means a stranger there. And the name of the other was Eliezer, which literally is, my God is my help. For he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And so, again, this Torah portion, it derives its name from the man that we know as Jethro, and it's Yitro in, in Hebrew, Yud, Tav, Resh, Vav, Yitro. And this gentleman was a distinguished personality in Midian because it says that he was a priest of Midian. In fact, some people believe that Yitro is merely a title and not really his name because he's first introduced to us as Reuel when uh, Moses is fleeing from Pharaoh and he helps uh, Jethro's daughters at the well. Anyway, that's how he's introduced to us. But According to this, he's heard the things that the Father has done. So apparently he heard about the plagues, he heard about the splitting of the sea, and all these other events that transpired. Word got out. Because remember, later on, as they're preparing to go into the land, and the spies go into Jericho, and Rahab takes them uh, and hides them in her house, she tells them, 40 years ago, we heard about all this stuff, and we've been quaking in fear since then. We've been waiting for you. So word got out. And so all these reports and then hearing that the people are coming to the mountain, obviously it prompts Jethro or Yitro to bring Moses' family to him at Horeb. And so just a thought here, sometimes the father uses a so-called outsider to help with the restoration of the family. You ever wondered why it is your kids will listen to somebody else before they'll listen to you? Why is that? You can tell. <laughs> you had to be here. Anyway, it just seems to be that way. It often requires there to be an outsider to speak into your family's life to help. And rather than us being upset about that, we should be thankful that at least there's somebody they'll listen to, right? Well, in this particular case, Jethro, as far as Israel is concerned, is an outsider. He's a Midianite, but he helps with the restoration of the family. There are times, apparently, when God uses these outsiders to, to provide great benefit to his people. And so I think we all need to be at least aware of that fact. That doesn't mean we just allow anything and everything to come into our bosom. It just means that sometimes, well, you know, it's not in the Bible, but it's a saying that really I think it's truthful. He moves in mysterious ways, right? How many of you have seen the movie Sergeant York with Gary Cooper? How many of you have heard of Gary Cooper? <laughs> Google it. <laughs> But throughout the movie, Gary Cooper playing Sergeant... Who, who, who's ever heard of Sergeant York? Okay, if you're from Tennessee and you haven't heard of Alvin C. York, Google it. Anyway, throughout the movie, he, he would always say, the Lord sure do move in mysterious ways. Thank you. And sometimes he uses people that we would never expect him to. Also, we see in this a, a pattern that restoration occurs on the heels of very climactic events. And so if we look at that as a pattern, then we should expect that there will be very, very tumultuous events, very earth-shattering events, where the nations of this world will be dumbfounded, will be probably stricken with fear and terror, but it should, within God's people, instill within them a confidence to know that our Father is at work and He's bringing about the restoration of 
his people, of his family. And so any future exodus is going to be preceded by these wondrous signs that we see uh, that fell upon Egypt and all the things that came after that. One other thing before I move on, this union, this restoration comes at the foot of the mountain where the covenant is going to be presented. So that's the setting for it. And I won't go into the prophecies about that, but Hosea chapter 2 would be an interesting chapter to read in that note. So even though he's an outsider, he provides great wisdom for Moses, and it, and it benefited the entire nation greatly. Because when he saw what Moses was doing, what was, what was required of him, he was convinced that you're going to have to get some help. So in verse 17 of chapter 18, it says, So Moses' father-in-law said to him, This thing that you do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you. I want to pause right there. It's not just the person who's having to deal with these things that are going to get worn out. It's the people who are going to get worn out too. And so he says that you need to do some things. You're not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter that shall, they shall bring to you, but every small matter they, them, they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you for they will bear the burden with you. And if you do this thing and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure and all this people will also go to their place in peace. So he gives some pretty sound wisdom for an outsider. Now, I, as I'm reading this and I'm thinking about it and studying about, you know, what to say, what not to say, it, it, it occurs to me that surely the creator of the universe knew that this was too much for Moses to handle by himself. I mean, don't you think? And yet, unless you can show me where it's at, I don't see anywhere up until this point that the creator of the universe, who knows all things, says to Moses, uh, this is going to be too much for you by yourself. You're going to need to enlist some help. And so he brings this counsel through this other person. So that just, again, tells me that I need to be very careful not to just quickly dismiss something that someone is telling me, if they're trying to help me, it might be that it's coming from the Father. And maybe he's just wanting to see, you know, am I willing to listen? Am I willing to be a humble enough person to listen to what this other person has to say? Because it might be something that really changes my life and for the better. Something to consider. We see that there are times in Scripture where people came to inquire of the Lord. That's what these people were coming to do when they were coming to Moses. And so there are instances in Scripture where it says they went to inquire of the Lord, and it might be just as simple as they went to inquire of someone who had spiritual authority. For example, according to tradition anyway, when Rebecca went to inquire of the Lord in Genesis chapter 25, when she's pregnant, she feels all these things going on inside her womb and she's troubled. Tradition says that she went to inquire of Shem. It doesn't tell us that in the Scripture, that's tradition. Point is that the scripture infers that there are times when people are going to come to those who are spiritually authorized to help people with hard issues. So I'm going to go ahead and get ahead of myself here, lest you think that I'm, we're just talking about one person in each assembly. We're not. We're talking about this is something really that is going to fall on all of us if we're going to be followers of the Messiah. Because the instructions given to us are not to go out and make converts, but to make disciples. To make disciples of Yeshua. As we follow Him, we teach others to follow Him. They're looking to us perhaps, they're listening to us perhaps, but ultimately the goal is for them to follow Him, to emulate Him, to be like Him in these things. And so it is going to fall upon us all to grow, to mature, to, to learn 
how to be those when others have questions, they have issues, and they're younger than you in this faith, that when they come to you that you're equipped to be able to give them an answer of peace, so to speak. So again, there are times in the scriptures where we see that people do go to those who have been spiritually authorized to handle these kinds of issues. And so Jethro points out what should have been obvious. This is way too much for one man to handle. And he made it clear, or the, he made suggestions that made it clear that this is gonna have to be approved of by God, but it just makes sense to have a group of people that are able to help bear the burdens of what's going on. So he suggested a system of delegated authority, basically a lower court system that would kind of come under him. He'd kind of oversee the whole thing, but we'd have all these other men who were equipped, who were, have the spiritual authority to handle these other situations. He would kind of oversee it, but he wouldn't have to get involved with every little thing. Now, it's still his responsibility to stand before God, to hear what the Father is saying, to teach the people the laws, the statutes, but other people could help in this. So it would appear then that Billy Shears was correct. I get by with a little help from my friends. Google it. <laughs> young people are not. Anyway, some of the older people are not. Anyway, you got to be right there where I'm talking about. Anyway. All right, so now we're gonna, <laughs> now we're going to look at the requirements for those that were going to help Moses judge the people. They were to be able men. They were to be men of accomplishment. Literally, men of valor, because the word that is translated as able is chayil. Can you put that word? Thank you. Chet yud lamid, chayil. Now, maybe some of you ladies have heard that word before, because it's the same word that's used in Proverbs chapter 31 that describes a virtuous woman, eshet chayil. So it's the same word to describe these men that Moses is supposed to look for. They are not to be lazy and apathetic by nature, but they are to be men of accomplishment, men of valor. And these are to be men who have displayed admirable qualities in their life. They're to be men who feared God. They are to be men who love the truth. And when I, when I think about that, that would imply to me they have to be men who are willing to adjust when they hear that truth because they love it, even if it means they have to kind of change some things about their lives. If they have to admit that I was wrong about that and to turn from that, these are the kind of men that you're going to be looking for, not those who are just digging in their heels and are unwilling to adjust so these are going to be men who feared God and they love the truth. These would be men who hate unjust gain. They're not going to be looking to have their palms greased. They're not going to be tempted by those who would try to influence them in a negative way to try to alter judgment. These are men that are going to stand above that. They're going to resist those kinds of things. They're not going to fear other men and not be negatively influenced by those other men. They're not going to be taken in by the lure of money and power and all these things and being connected. They're going to be incorruptible and above suspicion. They are, in my book anyway, they are the original untouchables, right? Google it. Anyhow, but it's also obvious that these men had to possess a knowledge of the Torah. They had to know what they were talking about. They had, they didn't, they weren't going to be able to get by with just having these good virtues and qualities that are going to have to have knowledge of what the Father has said and what He has instructed. They had to be able to recognize the truth. They needed discernment. I think everybody in this room knows and everybody who's watching knows that you know, there are things written for us, and sometimes in an ambiguous manner that leaves us wondering, well, how exactly do I do this? Is, you understand what I'm asking or saying? Shabbat. How do I keep Shabbat? Well, what do people typically do? Well, how do the Jewish people do it? And they get into all these traditions and customs and all these things. And my point is, sometimes 
our instructions that the, the instructions that are given to us are ambiguous as to exactly how we're to walk these things out. And so the first thing we need to do is turn to him, have a relationship with him, to listen to his voice, understand that we got, need to be guided by his spirit. And then what we find as we go down this road, that we'll meet people that the way we've applied it, they don't. They look at it a little differently. And we come into these situations, they do these things a little differently. My point is that we need to be able to discern that sometimes one size doesn't fit all. Sometimes we need to recognize that how I see this may not be exactly the way they see it. And so when we're working with people and dealing with people, it's very, very important that we need or that we are able to discern God's heart in the matter. Not just mine, but we need to be able to discern and consider God's heart when dealing with people. In other words, many people can quote scripture, many people can quote you what is written in the Torah, but when it comes to administering what is written in the Torah, if you're going to lead, you'll find very quickly that you're going to have a good dose of compassion, mercy, and understanding. Thank you for that one amen. I'll take it. But that's just the way it is. We've talked about this in times past, but we need to remember that the Hebrew concept of justice is judgment that is tempered with mercy. Mercy does not endorse someone's actions. It, is, it doesn't condone someone's action. Just because the Father has been merciful to me doesn't mean that he agrees with everything that I've done and said or thought. It just means that he has mercy and he allows me to live and he allows me to continue because he's on my side because that is his heart for me to overcome, for me to get to the finish line. That's his heart. And so if that's his heart toward me, that should be my heart toward others. It should be your heart toward others, that we have one another's back, that we're pulling for one another, that we're encouraging one another. Yes, sometimes we have to rebuke one another. Sometimes we have to discipline one another. But it should always be done with the Father's heart in mind in that he's all for us and he's wanting us to get to the finish line. He's wanting us all to get to that place where he can say, well done, good and faithful servant, right? So again, the Hebrew concept of justice is judgment that's tempered with mercy. He doesn't move his boundaries to accommodate what I want to do. It's just that he's merciful in the process of me figuring out what those boundaries are and how he wants me to live my life. So in everything that we do here in this congregation, in our families, Everything we do in this world should always be with God's standards in mind. Yes, he has rules. He has laws. He has instructions. He has boundaries. But again, administering those standards require that we be not only just, but that we be merciful in our justice. Remember that Moses, the guy that wrote the Torah, what does the creator say of him? He was the meekest man alive. And so if he chose who was someone who was regarded as being the meekest man alive to write the rules, it would seem to me that we should take that hint that this man is going to judge people in that manner. I mean, he could get angry. He could get frustrated. You know, the other day I struck the rock. If there had been a rock, I would have struck it. I know. And I'm not saying that because I'm proud. I'm saying that because that's just the way it is. You know, And so, I mean, we're all like that at times. But thankfully, he's merciful. You know, he's long-suffering with us. We get frustrated, we get aggravated, but, and I'm sure he does too. But yet he, I think, sends us a message that he chose the one who was considered to be the meekest man alive to write all of these things down for us and to be set over his people as a judge. So if Moses is going to be in a place where he has to choose men to help him in this, it only makes sense to me that he's probably going to do that with the way he would do things in mind. And, uh, 
I could be dead wrong on this, but I, it, I doubt very seriously that he was going to pick somebody that would just be sitting on go, ready to chop their legs off at the first infraction or the first thing that didn't go right. I just find that hard to believe. It seems to me that he's going to be looking for men that have that similar temperament anyway, or that ability to administer justice with mercy. According to Jethro's plan, the people would have judges over 10, 50s, hundreds, thousands. That suggests that this guy can handle 10, but he can't handle 50. This guy can handle 50, but he can't handle 100, and so on. And so he's going to have to be aware of those that are serving among them, you know, to, to know those who labor among you. And that is not something that you can do overnight, is it? That's something that takes time. It's a process. But by doing this, everyone could make their case. Everyone could bring their grievance, their issue, whatever it is, and not overwhelm just one man. But the benefit to the people is that their grievances could be heard and acted upon a lot quicker than if they just had to wait on one man to do it. And so we see a lot of things in this. And it's about understanding people and perceiving who has these strengths? Who doesn't have those strengths? What can they handle? What can't they handle? And it doesn't mean that one is superior to another. It just means that in life, some learn things a lot quicker because they had to. Some have matured more in this area. Your strengths probably help my weaknesses. My strengths hopefully complement or help with your weaknesses. That's the, the members of the body just working together. But now what's not stated in this is something that I think is very important. And that is, if Moses set all these different men over tens and fifties and hundreds and thousands, etc., so that he does not have to listen to everyone's grievance, then that means the people would have to recognize the authority that had been delegated to these men. Now there... That might be an issue with some messianics I've met. Because a lot of, none of you, I know, none of you. But a lot of people that have come out of mainstream come out, I ain't listening to nobody. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Nobody's going to, you know, be over me. And we get this, you know, this attitude. We're mavericks. We don't have to listen to anybody. And then we isolate ourselves. And then we wonder, where did all the people go? So the people themselves had to be willing to recognize the authority that had been invested in these people that Moses chose. And the people would have to be okay with the judgment that was handed down if they respected the authority that had been invested in these people. And they had to be satisf satisfied that others besides Moses would be making some decisions. Well, I want Moses to hear it. Well, that ain't going to work today. You're going to have to go to Shmuel. Well, I don't want to go to Shmuel. I'd rather talk to Moses. Well, here's the deal. You understand? And so the people are going to have to be willing to humble themselves in that way. Okay? So in the life of our congregation, there are, <laughs> there are bound to be things that pop up. There are going to be issues. Sometimes, unfortunately, there are going to be grievances. There are going to be disputes, these kinds of things. And it will be that way as long as there are these things called people. It's just going to be that way. And as I've taught in other, uh, at other times, you know, going back to Psalm 133, how, how lovely it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We're those living stones not those living bricks and those living stones have jagged edges sometimes, but we're being fit together to form this body, to form this house. And it seems to me that what we're supposed to do is as we're wearing on one another's nerves, kind of wearing one another out, that if we stay in that covenantal relationship that we find ourselves in, we keep rubbing up against the other guy's rough edges long enough that that relationship wears the rough edges off of both of us until we can more jointly be fit together. In other words, he made us different on purpose. He made us aggravating on purpose. <laughs> he made it where you just rub me the wrong way on purpose. You get under my skin 
and I get under yours, just like in a marriage. <laughs> I see some of the ladies going, mm-hmm, that's right, right, yep. <laughs> but because we're in that covenantal relationship, we're bound to one another, and we work through those things, and it is the same here. And so there are going to be things that come up in our congregation. And so taking the hint from Jethro, we are right now in the process of trying to organize in a way that benefits us all, that it all doesn't fall on me or Beth or just a few people, that it, it actually will benefit everybody in the congregation. Now, that's going to take a little time to do, but that's what we're going to do because that's the biblical pattern that we have before us here. And you should know that even in a group this size, I mean, this is nowhere, <clears throat> nowhere near two to three million people, but it's large enough that no one person can handle it, especially me, <laughs> you know, because, well, never mind, you don't want to hear that story. Anyhow, we have to enlist the help of others with the needs of the community, and so we're going to do that. But at the same time, we need to all acknowledge that the standards in the Scripture are going to be the last word because the standards in the Scripture have to be the standards here as well. Now, Jethro told Moses to provide such men. At least that's the way it reads in New King James. But I want to show you the Hebrew word that is, or the root word that's used there. And that is the word chazah. Do you have that for me, Jonathan? There we go. Chet zayin he, chazah. That's the root term that is translated provide. You provide these able men, Moses, these men of valor. The word chaza actually means to see or to gaze or to perceive. It also conveys the idea of having vision to see things that aren't so visible, things that aren't readily recognized outwardly. In fact, this word, the same Hebrew word, is often used to denote a vision. When Isaiah talks about uh, he had a vision in chapter 1, verse 1, in the days of King Amos. The word is chazah. He had a vision. He saw something that was beyond what the natural world had revealed. So the idea here is, or the implication is, that Moses was to, had to look beyond what was apparent outwardly. You know, there are a lot of people who are head and shoulders above everyone else in physical stature, but that doesn't mean they're the guy. So Moses is going to have to use discernment. He's going to have to have prophetic insight in selecting these men. It's similar to what we see when Samuel went out to anoint David as king over Israel. 1 Samuel 16, verse 6. So it was when they came, these are the, brother, uh, excuse me, these are the sons of Jesse, when they came that he looked at Eliav and he said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. He thought... That guy, he looks like a king. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. For the man looks, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, we, we've heard that passage all of our lives. But even though we've heard that passage all of our lives, what do we typically do? What is our first reaction to something, to find the one who looks like they'd fit the part. But it doesn't always work out that way. Because Saul of Kish was head and shoulders above all of his countrymen. He didn't do such a good job. Pride took hold of him. The father is looking at the heart. My point is that Moses apparently was supposed to look at the heart of that person, not necessarily their station in life, but the heart of that person. And so those who appeared able in this case here when Jesse's sons came before Samuel, those that appeared able to man's eye were rejected in favor of the one who was able in God's eyes, a man after God's own heart. So I want to go back to a previous statement. When administering these things that are written in Scripture, we need to understand God's heart not just our head, but we need to understand God's heart because to judge by the letter lends itself to religion and not relationship. And he didn't start a new religion. 
He just came to make that relationship between us and the Father possible again through the Messiah, through his Son. I didn't leave one thing and all its religious practices just to get into another religion. I'm not interested in that. What we're interested in is building a relationship with him and a relationship with one another. And so then we don't need to be those who would judge by the letter. I'm not saying we throw it out what it says. That's not what I'm saying at all. But we need to make certain that we are considered of the Father's heart when we deal with people in these situations. In other words, we have to be led by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth. We have to walk in the Spirit of truth. Now, I'm not a leader, you're saying. There is going to be a day, if it hasn't happened already, that somebody that's younger than you in the faith is going to come to you with an issue, with the problem, and you're the one on deck to help them. And you need to be prepared to do it. You need to know what he says in his word. It needs to be hidden in your heart that you may not sin against him. But you're going to have to be able to pour out of what's been poured into you and administer it in a way that pleases the Father. And not just give them rote, not just recitation, not just a regurgitation of what somebody else told you, but to be able to discern their situation, where they're at, what's going on in their life, and give them an answer of peace. That will fall to each and to every one of us if we are his disciples and if we're following the Great Commission by making others his disciples as well. Now, as a footnote to all of this, this criteria that's covered here is some of the things or some of the text that inspired some of the founders of this nation when it came to the formation of the type of government we have, specifically when it came to the House of Representatives, which is now, never mind. <laughs> they approached that the House of Representatives should be able men, much like what Jethro was describing to Moses. Able men, men of virtue, men that are of men of accomplishment, men that have discernment, men that love the truth, men that despise unjust gain, that these are the kind of men who were to be sought to fill these positions. This is just kind of a sidebar to the footnote. Initially, U.S. senators were not elected by the populace. They were appointed by your state legislators. The idea was that we don't want any one entity in the United States to have too much power, and that included the people. This whole thing about power to the people, that's more communist than it is republic. Okay? Now, well, that's with a little r, all you Democrats, okay? I'm not talking about the Republican Party. I'm talking about governmental philosophy and concept. So the power to the people only goes so far and only works well when that power is not given entirely to the people. If you want to look what and see what democracy really looks like, study the French Revolution. That's what democracy actually looks at looks like. But back to my point, the idea here was in the formation of the government initially to promote the goal of selecting able men. Not just those who were well connected, those who were of great physical stature, who were business connections and businessmen. It wasn't just that it was to be men who are able as defined by some of the criteria that Jethro lays out for us. Now, the admitted flaw in this was and is that those who elected these people weren't always able. <laughs> in other words, over time, people because of what people want, they abandoned these standards. And once we abandoned these standards, then that's when the chaos ensued. So to put it simply, when the people are corrupt, we have corrupt representatives. It's just that simple. In fact, Proverbs 29 verse 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. I've been groaning this week. <laughs> However, the people who rule are a reflection of the people who are being ruled. When the people are corrupt, 
their leaders are corrupt. I think it was William Penn who said something like this, those who will not be governed by God will be ruled by tyrants. Am I right, Alan? Yes, Thank you very much. So when people know that their rulers are virtuous men, people who rule with integrity, they feel that their problems can be coped with much better. But then compare that to what happens when well-connected and corrupt people rule over them. There's not going to be any peace. There's going to be constant turmoil. According to Jethro's plan, if you pick able men, if you choose able men, then you shall endure, Moses. You're going to be able to you know, see this through, and the people shall go in peace. Now we're going to go to Exodus 19, because in the next chapter, after this meeting between Jethro and um, his son-in-law, the people are going to prepare to meet God at the foot of the mountain. I don't know if Robert or Brandon can hear me, but we've got several people uh, flicking icicles off their nose. And so if you could come and help us out and adjust the air a little bit, I'd appreciate it. It is just a tad little cool. All right, Exodus 19, verse 1. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. And so Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. I have recited those verses again and again and again and again and again. And the thing I've always or first go to when I read those passages is how that their status being a holy nation and a kingdom of priests and the special treasure was predicated on if you hear my voice and if you keep my covenant. They had already been saved. They were saved because they placed their trust in the blood of a lamb. But in order to be the special treasure, Segula, that kingdom of priests, that Goikodosh, that holy nation, there was a condition placed on it. And that is if you hear my voice, if you keep my covenant. And so these are the things that we want to take away from that. If we are to be a kingdom of priests, if we're to be that holy nation, then I dare say the same standards apply to us. We've got to be able to hear his voice and we have to be able to keep his covenant. All the while understanding that it's not just rote in religion. It's not just memorizing these things. It's not all about the outward appearance. It's about the heart as well. You can't extract that from what he said here. So the arrival at Mount Sinai, the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, is seen as the, the culmination of the exodus, the coming out. They still have the journey to go on, but the coming out is, it culminates at Mount Sinai with the giving of the Torah. Of course, Shavuot, which is linked to the giving of the Torah, is uh, connected to this. In fact, in Hebrew, Shavuot is called Nazareth. And Nazareth is, I think the literal term is solemn assembly, but what it is saying is that this is the exclamation point on what he did over here. This is the kind of the ending or the reason that he did this. In other words, um, if they had left Egypt but not come to Sinai, the leaving Egypt wouldn't really have served a point because they would not have known how to live once they got into the land. More relevant to us is if Yeshua had died on the tree but had not been resurrected from the tomb, then we are yet in our sin. And so the, the death and his burial was very important, very prophetic, but it was all hinging on that on day three he had to come out of that tomb. Because if he doesn't, we're lost. Thankfully, he did. And because he came out of the tomb, I think we sang that song too. Yes. I walked right out of that grave, right? 
So all of these things are connected. And so he brings them to Mount Sinai as the exclamation point on what he did back in Egypt. But here's the theme of this connection between what happened at the Passover, what happened at the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. Here's the theme. Liberty without law results in lawlessness. Liberty without law results in lawlessness. Now, when people are corrupt and rebellious, they see what we would call liberty as being bound by a set of rules. You're telling me what to do. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. That's how corrupt people see true liberty. And conversely, they see lawlessness as true liberty. That is the liberty to do whatever I want, when I want, say what I want, think what I want, be what I want. I was born a man, but I'm going to be a woman. I was born a woman, but I want to be a skunk. <laughs> true story. Norway, Google it. Anyway. So again, if you want to see how corrupt people view liberty, go and look at the French Revolution. Because their version of liberty very often resulted in death. In fact, you could be on the ruling group on one day, rules got changed overnight, and where you were leading people to the guillotine yesterday, today they're leading you to the guillotine. In other words, that kind of liberty, they usually turn on one another because it's lawlessness. And so the way that seems right unto man will always end how? With death and destruction. So corrupt people have a skewed version or perspective or perception. What, I'm trying to think what the right word would be there. They have a skewed perception of what liberty is. They see it as being able to do whatever we want to do. But that is not the definition of liberty. Now, as believers... We understand, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, Paul writes, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, growing up in the Pentecostal church, that's usually what the pastor quoted when he was trying to calm the Baptists and the Lutherans who had wandered into one of these Holy Ghost services because their eyes were this big around. So he's trying to get them to, No, this is, this is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But what Paul was really getting at here in the context of his statements, the story of Moses being veiled because the people couldn't look directly on Moses because he had been in the presence of the Almighty. And so he connects that to the idea of letter versus spirit. And so what he says, more or less, is by the spirit, because we're guided by the spirit, the veil has been lifted, and we can see Messiah. We can see these things in the Tanakh. We can see these things in the Scriptures, and those people who are without Messiah, who don't have the Spirit, they're still looking at that veil. They haven't figured all these things out. I'm kind of reducing it into simple terms, but that's kind of what he was getting at. And he made this statement. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Here's why I wanted to bring that up. Because unfortunately, that statement and others have led some to conclude as believers that we can do whatever we want. That we don't have to do that. That's not for us anymore. If it comes left of Matthew, oh, that was for those people, but that's not for us. Unfortunately, that's what has happened. That's why a lot of you are here, because you come to realize that isn't quite right. I won't go into the details, but I have this one um, memory of something that happened many, many years ago. Someone in the congregation where we were, in this church that Beth and I were on staff at, and somebody went out and did something that was wrong. I mean, not even, you know, kind of wrong, but really wrong, blatantly and obvious wrong. And their justification was, well, the Spirit told me to do it. The Spirit told me so and so. Now, my thought was, which Spirit was that? <laughs> because the Spirit of truth is never going to te uh, teach us or tell us or lead us to do something that contradicts the Word of truth, right? Now, we know that. It's just funny how when people want to do what they want to do, they'll justify it and try to hide behind God 
or the Spirit told me to do so and so. <laughs> this is maybe not relevant, but came to mind when we were on staff at this particular church. I can't tell you how many people would come, come to this church, because it was happening for a little while there, and people say, oh, the Lord brought us here. The Lord led us here. They'd get upset about something three weeks later. Well, we're going to go. The Lord told us that we're going to go. <laughs> I kept thinking, man, you change your mind a lot. Anyway, my point is this. The spirit of truth is never going to lead us to do something that's false. He's not going to lead us into lawlessness. In fact, that idea of, well, I can do whatever I want in the body will lead to lawlessness. And thus we have this passage in Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. He who does the will of my Father in heaven. By the way, who is your family? Who, are, who is my mother? Who are my sisters, my brother? Those that keep the commandments of my Father is what Yeshua said. That's my true family, you know? Abram had to leave family, country, everything he was familiar with behind. He had to leave that. Because had he stayed in that, or he brought all of them with him, apparently he would not have been able to be the man that God called him to be. And I would strongly argue the same is true for you and me. Our family are those who keep the will of our Father. And so, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, to me, this is just in, in general saying those who do what they want to do, who don't respect the boundaries, who really don't understand what liberty is. The men and the women that God is calling in this day are those who understand that we are to hear and we are to keep. We are to hear what he says and that we're to do what he says. And with respect to his instructions and laws, also to hear his heart in this, to understand what his heart is, to understand what his spirit is saying to us through these things, not just to be able to read it and recite it, but to understand it. A lot of people know what the scripture says, but I would say fewer understand what the Scripture says because understanding doesn't come by intellect, not alone. The understanding comes by the Spirit of God. He's the one who helps us to understand, yes, the deep things of God. So let's consider what James said in chapter 1, verse 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. <laughs> you know, sometimes in the morning I'm shocked to see what I see in the mirror. Because I get up thinking I still look like I did when I was 25. <laughs> no. no, who is that? <laughs> anyway, has nothing to do with anything, but just... Something went through my head. Squirrel. Anyway. <laughs> he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. And so perfect liberty is understanding that God has given us a way to live, and if we embrace it, we're going to be blessed by it. 
and we're going to be guided by these standards that promote life. And then we are going to, in the process of time, we are going to lead others in this. We are going to be able to give them an answer of peace because we have found peace and that we've come to understand the perfect law of liberty is the Father has placed these nice little boundaries on the side of the road that are not to keep us from living but are to ensure that we live and that we have an abundant life to keep us from going off the edge to certain death and destruction. And we understand that our loving Father has done this for us and we, because we love Him, stay within those boundaries and we learn these things and we grow and we mature in these things. We, we understand His heart in these things. And then we are able to share that with others, to help them when they are in crisis, to help them with, when they have a situation that, that they need to inquire of the Lord. It might be that when they inquire of the Lord, he puts it on your heart to go to them and to help them. And that's how they get their answer from him. And so this responsibility falls upon us even as this blessing is given to us. And so as we are in position to lead others and to counsel and to guide others, let's make certain always that we're guided and led by his spirit. Don't just recite things to them. Share what he's put in your heart. To know his heart and these instructions that he's given us is critical. Again, his instructions are not designed to impede life, but to enhance life, to ensure life. Unfortunately, your rebellious hearts can only see them as unreasonable demands. You're just trying to ruin my life. You're just trying to keep me from doing this or that and the other. And I'm going to say, <laughs> I'm going to say this with as much respect as I can muster to, to put it in a way that's firm and yet considerate. Rebellious hearts exist not just outside the body, but in the body. We will, if we want to do something... If we want to think a certain way, we want to live a certain way, we will find a justification for it. But rebellious hearts, unfortunately, they see these boundaries as demands. And today's mindset in the world, of course, is to reject any kind of instruction. And consequently, today we are seeing an explosion of lawlessness. And unfortunately, many in the body will get caught up in this because it will be the path of, eases, uh, of least resistance that they choose to take. And I'm not sure when it was that we spoke of this, but it seems to me that if we're on the right path, it's going to be the hardest one. The things that he set before us to do, whether it's an individual, a family, this congregation, that that he set before us to do, it's going to be the hardest thing that we've ever done. But at the same time, we're going to be blessed in it. We're going to find life in it. We're going to find joy in it. We're going to find happiness in it because we're going to build relationships with one another because we're all kind of on the same team going through the same stuff. We need one another. We need to have one another's back. We need to be able and willing to pull that other brother and sister up when they have fallen and stumbled and not sit in judgment, but to be just and to be merciful because the Father that has put picked me up so many times and put me back on the path and says, you know what? And I didn't hear these words audibly, but I got the message. You messed up and you're going to have to pay some consequences of that. But you know what? I still love you and I'm still on your side and I'm still going to bring you into what I've ordained for you if you'll just kind of keep moving forward. We need to have that same kind of attitude with one another. Again, mercy does not condone sin. Mercy just makes it possible for people to overcome that sin. Amen? Let's not get caught up into the outbreak of lawlessness that's going on in the world and will touch the body. The instructions that God gave, the covenant that he gave at Sinai, uh, Sinai brought the tribes 
into allegiance with one God. Forget all that stuff you saw in Egypt. Forget all that stuff you saw on television yesterday. That's not what we're about. We are being brought into allegiance with the one and only God. And rabbinically, it's understood that this at Mount Sinai was when the kingdom of heaven was truly inaugurated into the earth. But what that means then is that the giving and the acceptance of the Torah is at the heart of what Israel's purpose is all about. To hear what I'm saying and to do what I'm saying, but not just for your benefit, but for the benefit of others, that you can help others, that you can counsel others, that you can guide others, that you can encourage others to move in the right direction, the one that leads toward life. In other words, to be that light. And as such, we are called to be a kingdom of priests. And I believe that that is for the whole nation. You know, the, we probably have talked about this from time to time as well. It is my opinion that the Levitical priesthood was more or less plan B. It was as a result of the golden calf incident. But because before that, you read in Exodus 19 that the nation was to be a kingdom of priests. The firstborn were considered to be the priests. And the implication is every tribe. My point here, though, where you and I are concerned is we are to be a kingdom of priests. We need to be equipped and empowered by the Spirit of God to function in that role to be able to teach others the difference between the clean and unclean, the holy and the profane, to be able to demonstrate to others the proper way to approach our Creator, but in so doing, the way Messiah did it, with kindness, with mercy, compassion, never compromise, but always with loving kindness and mercy and long-suffering with one another. Amen? In Isaiah 61, it says, You will be called the priests of the Lord, the ministers of God. All of that is predicated on this, if you hear my voice and keep my covenant. And so as James reminded us, what we read just a moment ago, we must be hearers and doers of the word in order to attain this. So hearing what I'm saying is not going to be enough. Doing what he has said is what we, what we must be faithful to. We can, we can ha this congregation could go 25, 30 years and you be here every service and hear all the things that are said. But if it never affects a change that wants to provoke us to draw closer to him, then it's just words. And that's why we need the spirit of truth to be here with us each and every time. Because I can't prick your heart. He can. I can't teach you these things. He can. He's the one who leads us into all righteousness. He's the one who teaches us. He's the one who guides us. Sometimes into trial and tribulation to teach and show us that even there, He's going to be there teaching us through all these things. So we have to be able to hear what he's saying, to perceive what he's saying, to perceive and understand his purpose. We need to be those able men and women that Jethro referred to. We cannot be distracted, nor can we be dissuaded from doing this by what's going on in this world. I'm telling you, There are things, and I'm sure you already know, that have transpired just this week that down the line, they will touch your life. They will affect my life. And we'll have to start making decisions. We'll have to start making choices. And some of these choices are going to be tough. They're going to be hard. And we had, and I'm talking to me too, we need to be very careful that we that we understand what he's saying in the matter for me, for us. All right, let me get off that, move on. Receiving the Torah at Mount Sinai is Israel's national heritage. And in some commentary I was reading, they made this point, that it was their heritage because it was suited for them. It was suited for his people. In, in other words, 
he didn't give this to the nations the way he gave it to Israel because the nations in their state of immorality and idolatry and all of these things, it would have just been equivalent to hearing from another God instead, instead of the God who is Echad, who is one. It would be akin to casting your pearls before swine who would trample it underfoot and then turn on you. And so Israel was presupposed and, and predisposed to receive it, to conform to it because they had this heritage. They had this from Abraham, from Isaac and Jacob. And so that's why he gave it to them. However, it was always with the understanding that once they embraced it, matured in it, walked in it, that they were to teach others to walk in it. So in that vein, I want you to consider this, that for the most part, for most of its history, not all, and not ignoring warts and flaws, but for most of America's history, this nation has been considered a beacon of light to the other nations. And I'm not saying that to brag on America. I know that people have got different opinions about different things that have happened. That's not the point. We're talking about purpose. Just like some people couldn't stand Donald Trump, the person. I was looking at the purpose. Some people don't like Chairman Biden, I mean President Biden. But just like everybody else, if, if he's there, then he's God's man for, the reason, for a reason. So what's the purpose, all right? So the nation, yeah, I've just, boy, I've made some enemies right there. Which part, right? Okay. For the most part, this, this nation has been a beacon of light to many nations in the modern era. And why, why was that the case? Why did most people want to come here? I'm looking for a word. Liberty. Freedom, same thing. Liberty, okay? Okay. Even descendants of people who were brought here against their will have in time enjoyed some of the benefits of that liberty. So people would come here seeking liberty. Now, unfortunately, over time, and because we forgot what kind of man we are as a nation, that liberty has now become lawlessness. And there is this explosion of lawlessness. So my, here's my point in connecting this to America. If God's people would walk in the perfect law of liberty, others would see that. And then seeing that, you know what they'd want to do? Be part of that. To be joined to that. You are a city set upon a hill which cannot be hidden. And what is that city set upon a hill supposed to do? It's supposed to draw others to it. Amen? And so then, we need to walk in that way as well. In time, the fruit of lawlessness is going to become evident. In time, that fruit is going to become evident, and people will be repulsed. And there will be people repulsed by the fruit of lawlessness who will be looking for what is true, and what gives life. And that's where you and I need to be waiting for them, ready to receive them. There will be people who will not like what you have to say, what I have to say, where it is true. Because right now, a lot of people don't want truth. They want what they want. So in the process, you and I had better find the courage that only he can give to stand in what is true regardless of what's going on in this world. And to be those kinds of people who would tell people not what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. And then as we do it, to remember the heart of the Messiah. There's going to be great need for those able men and women who are equipped and who are empowered to help people with their questions and their issues. Head knowledge alone is not going to suffice. We're going to have to be guided by the Spirit of God. And so, I'll conclude with this. Our Father is looking for a few good men and women for what lies ahead. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 25, Hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, 
to him I will give power over the nations. And then he quotes Psalm 2. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. And then he says, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's what Yeshua was saying right then. The same power and authority that's been given to me to rule over the nations, I'm going to give to my people, those who have overcome and those who keep my works until the end, those who persevere, I'm going to invest that authority in them. Do you really think he's going to give that kind of authority to people over others if we haven't learned to govern ourselves? All right? I don't think so. So let us, I'll go ahead and conclude. Father, again, we thank you for your words. And I just pray that everything that is of your spirit, everything that is true, those are the things that will stand, those are the things that will resonate within us. And Father, where I've stated my opinion or my thoughts that are not um, that are not in sync and in line in concert with whatever you're saying, I pray that those things would just dissipate and fall and come to nothing. But let your word be true. Let your word stand. I pray, Father, that you will provoke us to be the men and the women that you've called us to be, to stand against things that are false, to think against those things that are wicked. And not with an arrogance, not with a, a rebellious attitude, but to stand against those things in confidence that the spirit of truth has placed us here to be your people, to be your voice, to be your oracles in this day and time. Help us to approach this with humility and with the belief that, Father, that if we are faithful, you are going to bless and bless our lives and others are going to be blessed by what you're doing in and through us. I thank you for this congregation, and I thank you, Father, for the people that you've assembled here. I thank you, Father, those who join us online. And I just pray, Father, that you will help us all to rise above our own um, opinions and thoughts and, and, and mindsets so that we can all come together in allegiance to the one true God, to lay aside our whims and our desires and, and what we want to do and think that we might embrace your truth. But these things we pray and ask and you, we believe you for in Yeshua's name. Amen. Beth.